Marlo, and this is the Let Pleasure Be the Measure podcast. And I bring you today someone I've known for quite a while, but only through Zoom. I'm so excited to have her here finally, Tracy O'Connell. She is an educator and a coach. She focuses on LGBTQ teens, adults, and families, such important work. And she uses some of uh, Brene Brown's um, daring, daring way work, but we'll find out. So she's going to tell you even more about herself. Hello, Tracy. Hey, Pasha. Good always to, good to see you. You too. You too. I've, I always enjoy talking to you. Um, you, you hold beautiful, kind and compassionate space. So I can only imagine how lucky your clients are to, uh, get you as a coach. Yeah. Well, I guess you'd have to ask them, but, um, I'm doing my best. <laughs> That's good. That's all you can do. And and you recently started working with Brene Brown's organization. Is that right? Yeah. So I did a training. <clears throat> excuse me. I guess it was in um, 2018. Okay. Okay. So yeah, for a while now. And is that the Daring Greatly work, or what is that program called? The, the through Brene Brown. Right. So, um, so she has like three tiers of doing curricula. And the first was Courage Works, which was kind of a private grouping um, that still exists as like a grandfathered type mm-hmm. training. Um, and then the Daring Way or being a, becoming a certified Daring Way facilitator, which is what I did, mm-hmm. um, is really for um, like more clinical work. It's more um, for uh, licensed clinical social workers, more therapy oriented to really get into the source of our feelings and our life experiences, our traumatic experiences. Um, a lot of clergy do the work mm. to um, to understand, to bring basically what Brene Brown discovered in her research around shame, vulnerability, authenticity, shame, resilience, um, self-compassion. Yeah and that type of work. And so that is the work that I am trained in. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, she, you know, she's written six books altogether. She went on to write Dare to Lead, which is a book primarily for the business sector. Yes. It's kind of an umbrella of Brene Brown. And then there's the clinical side and then there's like the business side. Mm-hmm. And so most recently her focus has been on the business side, like, you know, working on making daring leaders and how do you lead with courage and how do you lead with vulnerability and those kinds of things. So, but I'm more on the clinical arm of, I'm not a therapist, Mm -hmm. um, but the work I do is very therapeutic um, with individuals and groups around these concepts of vulnerability, shame, courage, and authenticity and self-compassion. Yeah. And there's such universally (laughs) human um, needs that they can be used in any population. Um, but it's such a beautiful container or outline. So I love, I love that you have that. Um, yeah, it is. And, and for me, it was really, uh, I mean, after reading decades and decades of self-help and self-healing mm-hmm. books, I feel like that curriculum really spoke to me when I read Daring Greatly, like 10 years ago or whatever, I felt like finally I had a language and an understanding of vocabulary of it was like a fly on the wall of somebody had gotten inside my brain to know like what had been missing um, and, and just gave me language and then access to tool and really tapped into my own curiosity of wanting to know more and like wanting to do this kind of work because for so many years, I didn't feel like I belonged or, and I struggled with being authentic and knowing what that was like. And, and all of us ultimately now I know from working with so many other people, these are just human struggles that everyone has. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so it's just, it makes it pretty easy to strike up a conversation. However, there's a lot of reluctance around these topics. People get uncomfortable yes. talking about them. So that's always the biggest challenge. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, as coaches and therapists, you know, I I'm certain I say shame, vulnerability, courage, belonging, and authenticity every day, just per, perhaps many times a day in just my talking to people, small talk even. And so it's, it's interesting to imagine that, that these words don't exist uh, in, in all conversations and all, uh, you know, 
around the world. So it's, it's, she really has provided a, a language that, that we can all really understand. And she's, she gives great um, definitions of each um, working definition through research. So yeah, it's been very helpful, very helpful. Well, and you're woke, right? So you're, you're tapped in, you were looking like you were receptive for this. Right. So it didn't blow your mind, although I'm guessing it made you feel seen or understood in some way. Yeah. And that's how it felt for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we were talking before I pushed record when all the good conversations happen often is that when we work with LGBTQ youth in particular, um, they're in so many ways already woke and aware and at a heightened level of emotional intelligence and need for belonging acceptance, but willingness to also put themselves out there and, and really help to educate others. And so we were talking about how, you know, while we want to speak to all populations, we actually want to speak to the people who are, who are not yet comfortable with this language, who are not yet comfortable with their own shame or acceptance uh, or belonging because they need the help, right? Is that who you coach or what, who do you coach? Well, yeah. So the irony is that, you know, I do these groups, I do the, the coaching either one-on-one -on -one or small groups, no more than 10, because I'm creating like an intimate safe space, um, mm -hmm. to have conversations where people can talk about really honestly, what it's like to be them, what their struggles are. Um, and also we, we talk about different topics each time. So it might be about, trust like what does it mean to trust someone what are the what are the properties of trust like how do we break that down into respecting boundaries being reliable being accountable holding confidences living yeah. with integrity being non-judgmental being generous giving people the benefit of the doubt and the funny thing is that i um i started the leading the lgbtq teens when a, a mother asked me to mm -hmm. work with her child and um, then we, I wanted that to be a bigger experience. So I started um, recruiting and trying to get more to, to have a sense of like, we're not working with you one-on-one -on -one because there's something that's private that we can't talk about, but really having camaraderie. And yeah. so when the first group was assembled, um, you know, one of the kids said, is this curriculum, like how is, is this curriculum different than the curriculum you work with teens that are not LGBTQ plus part of that community? And I said, no, it's, it's the same. Right. It's the same curriculum. All the topics are the same. And they said, well, well, why are you just doing this with us then? And yeah. I said, because one of your moms asked me to. And, and I think that it's just great to have these questions of, and it really gets back to this authenticity or, or belonging, right? Like authenticity is that deep connection we feel to self. And then belonging is that desire to really be deeply connected to someone else. And so I certainly wasn't intending to separate the mm -hmm. LGBTQ plus community from others. Like right, I was, right. it, what the intention wasn't to other them. Right. It was though to have a sense of safety and camaraderie and maybe share what those experiences are like for them. The irony though, is that these kids were like so much more skilled, yes. open, understanding. Like it was almost like we, I wasn't teaching them anything. Like it was almost like they were teaching me or giving real life examples to the things that we were talking about and really just made me so aware of um, how much more advanced or how much more genuine, authentic, real, like living vulnerably every day and really becoming masters of that mm -hmm. instead of the, the, the rest of society who thinks that they've got it going on and that these others are othered. It's like the opposite. <laughs> it's like yes. the LGBTQ teens are the ones who are the wisest Yes. And the most knowing and the most authentic and real and trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden you you juxtapose that against everyone else. Who's, you know, like my group say of teen girls to ages 14 through 18. And as a woman, I really struggled during those ages. And I know for my being a parent myself, like those are ages where kids need a lot of extra support, but they were so much less willing to share. And like, no one would even communicate except in the chat and, people were, so you could tell by their behavior that they were reluctant to say what they really thought and felt. 
So, so it was just of, ironic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of fear of being judged, um, expectations, and they're worried about, you know, looking like they're flawed or uh, not perfect. And I think with the LGBTQ youth, they're, they're quite used to being marginalized and mis, uh, misinterpreted and, and misjudged. And so, and actually in the world of therapy, often uh, a therapist will focus, like a, a child comes to them with anxiety or depression, and then they identify as LGBTQ. The therapist will then sometimes focus on the sexuality issues when that's that's just, you know, who they are. There's some anxiety and depression there, but it's not necessarily because of their orientation. So it's fascinating how there's still this um, misunderstanding and a lens um, that I'm so glad you're breaking down some of these barriers. And it would be fascinating someday to incorporate uh, those two groups or somehow allow them to, to meet and help and uh, learn from each other, you know? Yeah, that would be really cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I have found that as soon as I came out as bisexual and entered the LGBTQ community myself, that all of a sudden I am surrounded by people who are relentless in their truth telling. It's like, mm. act, like actually nothing else matters other than speaking their truth. And there's a bit of a sense with the midlife women of, ah, eh, like, I don't care if you don't like me anymore. I don't care if you, you know, think I look odd or say th strange things. There's this uh, kind of fierce sense of self. Um, but I didn't feel that in my uh, community of uh, female identified friends prior to coming out. So there is, you're right, there's this camaraderie and uh, almost fearlessness uh, of wanting to be seen, heard and visible and really not standing for anything else um, and being willing to be part of the change. Cause we're in this cusp. I think of, I love talking to, to the youth right now, like 25 and under are, have such a great sense of uh, um, inclusion and hope. Uh, and, and I see this difference, like this really significant difference between generations as to uh, how inclusive they are and are willing to be. Yeah. And like you, that gives me so much hope because mm -hmm. I have kids who are now 22, 19, and 16, and I feel really optimistic yes. about the, the world that they are in and that they're creating, creating. Um, yeah. with just a completely different repertoire of, of what judging and criticism does and how it, it's not only cruel, but how limiting it is, how much it limits the richness of a full life experience. Mm -hmm. And that really being curious and being sort of a fascinated anthropologist and being open make, makes life just so much more rich and rewarding and free and, and requires less energy uh, than, than all the pretending of the generation that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. And so celebrating our differences and uniqueness and not being afraid of uh, talking with somebody, even if it's a difficult conversation um, about our differences. I, I think we're, I think the youth are ready for those um, difficult conversations for sure. And so when you talk to LGBTQ youth or teens, um, you mentioned that it's often more challenging once you incorporate the parents into the conversation. Is this mainly the generational gap or what, what do you, how do you see it? Yeah, you know, I think that, um, I mean, I, I fully own that I think I'm, I'm getting exposed to a biased population where the parents that reach out to me are parents who are already open, loving, curious, confused, mm -hmm. um, trying to do it right, and they just don't know what right is, or they don't know you know, what pronoun to use with their child that, that used to be known as this person. And now they're known as this person. Um, one family who has, is like two, two people who are divorced, who have children from an original marriage, and now they have second marriages and the younger, there's like a teenage crew. And then there's like a five-year-old and the five-year-old is confused. Like, why do you keep telling me to change the the name of like, why do I keep having to change what I call them? And mm. how come you talk like being corrected and not understanding? And so, so again, I, I guess what I want to say is that I'm, I'm fortunate to have clients who are already open, willing, wanting to learn. Um, 
and also obviously really love their kids. Yes. To ask and them. I think that that, that makes it so much easier. Mm -hmm. The real challenge and where the work really needs to come is to, to really help those who are so, you know, who are ostracizing their children and, and just the, the outrageous number of homeless LGBTQ teens who were, who left because they were rejected by their families. Like that's another layer that I'm too new to this to really get into, but something that I aspire to because that's, like I'm just finding that the work I'm doing is not as hard as I thought it would be because I'm already dealing with people who are really trying. Yeah. So a higher rate of homelessness and suicide in the yes. community. Um, and so how to reach, how to reach uh, parents. Um, and I just went to a gender identity and sexuality conference based on preventing violence uh, towards the community. And they said, you know, we just keep needing to start like as young as possible um, and keep putting the, the word out there and find, give allow the kids in school the language they need to um, prevent, stand up for themselves, be allies, and then go home and language they could use at home. And that it's going to take just so many angles because an adult who has these biases or judgments is less likely to go to a workshop or a conference or hire somebody to help. And so um, the kids are receptive. And so this particular organization, which was fantastic, was really talking about incorporating into the school, into the curriculum, the teachers and, and the students. Um, and then knowing how to, when a parent or relative or bus driver, whatever, makes a comment that could be interpreted as um, judgmental or violent, like how to step in, how to um, reduce the conflict and how to avoid it perhaps. So uh, modeling to the kids and the adults in the room, <clears throat> uh, how that can be done. So it was really fascinating. We did a lot of role-playing on, but yeah, that, that kind of work um, is, seems to be one way, because how else do you reach people who don't know <laughs> that they can improve and evolve or don't want to, right? They just don't want to, they don't want to necessarily learn anything new. They're set in their ways and- Yeah, they right. And they, they figured inclusive. out, that's right. They figured out how they can feel most safe or comfortable. And right. there's just um, that smallness of like a really small existence of what's okay. Mm -hmm. and, and all the things that are not okay. And mm -hmm. like, what is the, what's the secret key to unlock um, that, that mystery and, and really make it be something beautiful and loving because, because nobody wins, um, no. when <laughs> nobody feels good about hurting each other. Right. Right. Yeah. I know. I wish I could get every, everybody to do some sort of, you know, whether it's improv or theater role-playing, because what came out in the conference is that so many of the people there found um, comfort in in theater or role playing, like trying on different hats, trying on different characters. It gave them a lot of empathy, and then the audience uh, witnessing these stories. Uh, it could be really powerful um, to to kind of play and be curious under the guise of a you know a theater performance or an improv class. Um, there's a little less pressure. You could just kind of you know try on this hat, try on that hat, and. Uh, and that, that was really empowering. I, I was surprised that probably 90% of people had utilized that sometime in their lives to, uh, to learn and unlearn patterns. Yeah. And it sounds super cool. I would definitely be into doing that. <laughs> yeah. 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 If I, I do it with my uh, midlife uh, groups and my therapeutic comedy work and, you know, giving people the permission to say things they've never said before, giving people permission to act even if it's not a way they want to act out in the real world, like what would it be like if you were a kind of person who, who was, you know, racist or homophobic, what might you say? And it's like, it just brings us to a place of perspective and understanding on both sides. So yeah, it's been, it's been fun. Um, but of course the people who don't want to learn aren't going to do that either. So, so yeah, yeah. Right. Sometimes you feel like you're talking to the, yeah, you're just right. preaching to the choir or like talking right. to the people who already feel the same way that you do. 
Right, exactly. And that's why you mentioned the word a few minutes ago, violent. And, mm -hmm. you know, it makes me think of nonviolent communication of yes. just, which is really not hate, just hate speech, but it's really like any language we use with one another that built, that puts a wall or a barrier between us and someone else. And it yeah. can be little things like even, you know, just the conversations we have daily with our kids or partners or someone even at the, you know, a stranger that, mm -hmm. that is judgmental, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's mm -hmm. subtle. Right. That, 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 and there's a whole, that's a whole other topic, but, um, but that's where, even when we find humor in things that <clears throat> make fun of people what we don't agree with right and we can find humor in that and levity and joy and feel I don't know if it's a matter of feeling better than or if we're laughing just because it's so it's so sad that it's funny or whatever we're doing but but just to realize like yeah you know even when we're doing that that we're we're putting a, a, a barrier up between yes. us and them <clears throat> and we're othering yes we're othering right. and and that ultimately um othering is not connecting and everyone talks about this global crisis of loneliness mm -hmm. and people wanting to be connected to other people and then this whole sort of oh i didn't realize that what i was actually doing in connecting with this group is othering that group yeah um, so, so much, so much there, right? It takes so much self-reflection because we fall into our own limiting beliefs and habits and patterns of interaction. And, and sometimes it takes, um, a catalyst moment or something to, to have it reflected back to us, uh, and to change. I, I find that in, in my work, there's a, people who don't necessarily make a change unless they're in physical or emotional pain or in a crisis or in a transition. And then they're like, oh, okay, this is a good opportunity for me to be more self-aware and self-compassionate and take a look at myself from a different perspective. And it opens up their eyes to this, you know, expansiveness, but often we don't create the space for that transformation to happen, you know, because we're just moving through our day and surviving, surviving each day. Yeah, um, no, no, for sure. And um, I, like you said, I think it, it usually is a crisis of some sort that that brings people to their knees and says okay help me i need help and you know that's why i feel like kind of you and i being at the alive at this time in history with the pandemic i feel like people are broken open enough like sort of raw enough um kind of i don't know they're, they're sort of at their wits end of how mm -hmm. to cope and that is when that's when there is more willingness, openness, receptivity to being almost like from a sense of desperation. Okay, I'll, I'll try anything. Like, I just want to feel better. And yeah. this is, you know, the work that I do and the work that you do are really centered around less suffering. You know, pain is part of living, yes. but I really don't believe that we're here to suffer, like that that's, yeah. our, that's our purpose. I mean, Buddhists would say life is suffering and that's, you know, we can all make convincing arguments to, to go around that idea, but, but I don't believe that we have to like that, that, that what we learn to, by, by aspiring to reduce our suffering, we not only survive, but we, we thrive and we become people who can open and heal those around us, right? Mm -hmm. Reduce mm -hmm. the suffering of those around us too. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think a lot of parents probably come to you or to me when they see their child suffering more than they've ever seen their child suffer. You know? Yeah, well, that's what's also crazy is that I've been offering these groups, the, the Brene Brown work around, um, you know, vulnerability and, and compassion and shame resilience for, for many years now. And people, there's just this resistance um, by adults who are like, um, Either, either they're too uncomfortable with those topics and they don't want to go there or they know exactly what that's about and they can't they can't possibly like take the blinders off and go there because it just is too overwhelming hmm. um, and and they what I've also noticed is so interesting is that people will pay for things that make like they will invest money in things that make money mm -hmm. and people will invest in things that make them more attractive 
Hmm. Not necessarily but, sex, but just more attractive to the to themselves or the whichever world. Whichever they be, you know, whether it be like, you know, hair, makeup, clothes, uh, um, oh, beauty, you know, physical you beauty, right? Things that make them look or feel more attractive. But that the, there's this hesitancy of investing in themselves and making themselves feel better. Like I should be able to do that on my own. I don't need someone else to help me with that. That's a deficiency in me that I'm not able to do that. And I'm not going to own that. Like, but they will do it for their children is what you were, what I was getting back to. Absolutely. They will invest in, in alleviating their own children's suffering people, especially a lot of women and, and, and men too, but, but we'll say, I'll take the burden of my suffering. Like that's my cross to bear. I just don't want to hand it off to anyone else. And you and I both know that when we can um, alleviate our own suffering and then hold better space for and comfort those around us. And I mean, with your humor and things, you're able to drastically improve even really, really, really like legitimate physical pain um, and uncomfortable hospital situations and illness and things like that um, with just the power of being able to shift the perspective of that moment mm-hmm. yeah. um, and be more loving and compassionate and tender and, and divert from what seems to be the way I should be feeling to right. like, well, let's, let's try feeling this way. Let's be yeah. silly or let's be, let's look for the most ridiculous aspect of this thing. Yeah. That's the curiosity. And right. Sometimes it's just so bad. It's funny, but I would have to admit that I would, um, I have that self-sacrificial mother gene in me. And, you know, I would, I think just feel like I give up everything for my, you know, kiddo to feel better. So I think it is challenging to find that, uh, that self-care and that um, ability to make space for ourselves when our children are suffering, when our children are in crisis, it's almost like like it's, there's, there's nothing else. It's just, that's the, um, the lens we're looking through. And so, um, I, I found pleasure and humor, but only because my kid was suffering. So it's like, he was my catalyst. Um, and I'm sure I helped him by helping myself, but I'm like, I wonder how long I would have gone without humor and pleasure. Had I not found myself facing a life and death illness, you know, and I, it's just interesting to me because I see now the value in it, but I could have gone on with the just fine enough, you know, life didn't, didn't know how much I was lacking. Well, and also to even dare, right. To have the courage to even go kind of countercultural or counter conditioning that, that you could make joy and laughter in these times. Cause there's many people who get locked into the belief of how they should be feeling. And that's, that's kind of my, um, or what's appropriate, right? That's kind of my jam too, is regarding emotional intelligence is that all of our feelings are important. And I think, you know, our culture really teaches us that we should be happy all the time or rewards us for being happy all the time. And I know that your podcast is about pleasure. And so I am not diminishing the value of pleasure. Um, what I'm saying though, is that we're not just supposed to feel happy no. and enjoy, Glenn and Joel, I heard recently, you know, say we're supposed to feel everything That's and amazing. it's not, it's not feeling sad, mad, outraged, angry. It's not feeling the hot red emotions or the sullen, sad, morose emotions that are bad. It's our judgment of them. Mm-hmm. That's bad. Mm-hmm. So if we can be like, yeah, I'm feeling really hot and nasty today and be like, okay with that. It's you're much more likely to get to that lighter, pleasant, um, calm place by not holding those negative emotions hostage, but by just accepting them and being like, okay, now I want to shift from that to something that feels better Mm -hmm. rather than judging it and saying, feeling that way is bad. Right. No, feeling that way is that's my human, that's my humanness. Uh, that's real. And I'm a half a human. I'm not a human if I'm not allowing those things. And then, then, then once you recognize, then you can do what you do about, yeah, but I, I want to feel differently. I want more pleasantness. What are the things that bring more energy into my life? What are the things that bring more joy? Yeah. And it doesn't always start with something that's pleasurable. Sometimes it starts with a, a good cry or a scream or a long shower. And then it's like, you start to move the struggle and fear or anxiety, whatever it is, shame out of your body. Or like your yoga, right? Like your, 
your comedy yoga. Um, you have a cute name for it. What was it again? I call it yoga, yoga but I, yeah. you know, instead of yoga, it's I just add an H. Yeah. Well, no, but I mean, I experienced that with you. And I mean, it was, it was so powerful because instead of just keeping all that energy inside, uh, letting it move through your body and the embodiment of it, and then the release of it, of that energy, because emotions are just energy in motion, but we often just say, no, it's energy that is potential energy that I'm just going to hold on to for 40 years and hope <laughs> that it doesn't ever cause any problems. Well, that's and good luck with that. Know, causes all sorts of, you know, body, um, absolutely illness for, for real. And then we pass it on to your point before you, you pass on these, uh, this struggle in the patterns of limiting beliefs and judgments and the patterns of shame or prejudice and biases. If we don't really, you know, face them and, uh, challenge them, uh, head on. So I love that you do that work with the parents as well. Um, because I, that's probably where more friction <laughs> is apparent. And what would you say is the I guess, most common um, conflict that the parents of LGBTQ youth feel right now? Well, you know, it's in, what's funny is that people, like I said, again, will contact me. It's the parents typically that contact me and then they say they want this for their kids. And then I say, I offer a parallel group for the parents and they'll say, no, I'm really busy. Like I need this just for my kid right now. And mm -hmm. Um, you know, I can't change that. I mean, I can say, I really think the reason I love doing this in parallel is to give you a common language to help you talk with your kids about what it's like to be them. And maybe even the overlap that you all see, like this may look like courage in you, and this may look like courage in them. And really, um, I think the biggest, the biggest theme though, is just confusion. I think that I'm fortunate enough to see and interact mostly with parents who deeply love their children. And they're just, they're just confused. And they don't, I think there's fear of like, is life going to be harder for them? Yes. What is my role in making it easier? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's the biggest common theme. One, um, one parent told me that the best way for her to manage the way that that having a trans teen had impacted her was just to throw away her rule book, to throw away all of the concepts that she had when she adopted her child from China, like all the things that she had imagined would be true yes. for that child. Like, yes. oh, what would, well, would the child would be interested in this and this and this, and we would go here and we would have this life and then they would go to college and they would grow up and be this like, and, and just, having to throw that out, throw out that picture. Yeah. And that's another, you know, I, I do love Glennon Doyle, but like, that's another thing is nothing causes us more unhappiness, grief, strife, stress, anxiety, than the picture right. we have in our heads of how things are supposed to be. In anything, in our in children, anything. our marriage, our yes. home, our career. Yeah. And so if we can come at all of these relationships through that lens of what if I, I say, I sometimes say to myself today, I like, I wake up right now and I, I like know nothing. Like I try to like clean slate it. What would I think if I knew nothing? And I'd be like the sun. That's, that's incredible. Like I would just be like, how, what would it look like to look at flowers for the first time? And then I think, what would it look like to look at my child for the first time? I wouldn't come to it with, you know, I wish you felt better. I wish you could play sports. I wish you had more friends. I would just be like, there's this being who we love each other and I can hug on and help. I just like, it's so interesting uh, to do that with our relationships um, come to come from a place of not only nothingness, but um, open-minded to any new experiences without the holding on. Of... Yeah. Even like, like almost an alien lands on the planet yeah. what would they yeah. see. And then, and how would you, you know, what would they see with it if they, you didn't know they were there? Because if you knew they were there, then you'd be trying to show them some, the way that you want them to see the world right, is, right. rather than how it is. Um, Absolutely. You know, and that's something, and this is a topic for another day, but I'm really into, um, I'm really into learning more and more about the, the power of psychedelic, um, of psychedelics and psychedelic guided therapy and therapeutics, because 
so many people try as they might cannot get out of their earthbound beliefs and, yeah. and their experiential beliefs. Cause we're all just walking around looking at the world through the lens of our own human experiences, our own traumas, our own mm. lived um, humanness. And that just the potential for psychedelics to not, not become an escape, but mm-hmm. become a, a guided experience in the proper, with the proper mindset guide and setting mm-hmm. to say, what if, what if I erase, like to, to step out of what I know to be true to what could be true, be true. and the potential. And then those, there's just a ton of science to back up the idea of that being so um, helpful in just kind of instead of spending years and years and years and years trying to erase or reprogram ourselves to really just quite quickly be like, yeah, wait, the sun is beautiful and all of this stuff doesn't matter. Right. Right. And it feels so still kind of fringe and taboo to talk about psychedelics or that my last guest talked about magic mushrooms and how she uses them often in sexual trauma healing. And, um, you know, I, I haven't delved into that. Um, but part of this experiment is opening my eyes up to that. Like, it's just because somebody put that message into my head that psychedelics are either unhealthy or wrong or dangerous or whatever I, I believe. And so to let go of that, and then the world just opens up to all the possibilities. Um, I think that's fascinating. I love that you're delving into. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's difficult to delve into because it's illegal right and so and it's not, not in so, all states right i know well it's it's tricky and and so it's not i'm not saying this on you know air today because i'm like saying i'm doing that and offering that but it is something that gives me hope for the future because i think there's just so much scientific data about yeah. like mdma helping for ptsd and um and war veterans and just you know all sorts of things that that i think that taken to some to really not ever just as a, something you do on the street, but something with, with support and safety um, and mm-hmm. someone who really can hold you through whatever might be recur- revealed in that yes. kind of thing. Yes. Um, it just excites me because I think that it's getting to the point of un- being undeniable about how helpful that could be for people to overcome their biases, their biases against other people, their biases against um, you know just all the political division we have. Um, you know, they've used these things in the Middle East to help resolve conflict. Like there's just, um, wow. I don't know. I, I, again, it's what you choose to focus on. So it's easy to focus on and get overwhelmed by all the negativity in our world. Mm-hmm. And, but yet when, like you've done with your work, when you really seek out um, alternatives that are beautiful and outside your comfort zone can be really, um, can be really wonderful. Absolutely. And encouraging and hopeful. Yes. And I love that really all this comes from a place of curiosity. Like, uh, I feel like almost like so many of our suffering, so much of our suffering, I should say, can be eased by letting go of expectations and exploring curiosity and play. Um, But still, I, I think it's just a wonderful path. And I love that you're holding space for the youth and the teens and their parents. And even if it's reaching just the parents who were willing to call you like, that parent's going to be far more likely to embrace the next conversation with another parent, perhaps with a different lens or different languaging. So it's beautiful what you're doing. And I hope that everyone is listening, um, reaches out to you or looks at your website or your Instagram channel. What's your best, what do you think is the best way to uh, find you? Well, probably my website. I post pretty frequently on Instagram, but I think that's more of a blog for me of just sharing like things that are on my mind. <laughs> yes, um, I see a lot of flowers on there. It's yeah, well, right. I, I have my gardens like my my um, happy place. So yes. yes, if you like flowers, that would you can also <laughs> find me for that um, because nature never stops to uh, inspire me with awe. But um, yeah, my website is my name. Um, Tracy with an E, T R A C E Y O C O N N E L L M D dot com. So it's uh, Tracy O'Connell M D dot com. And I've got all my son of backstory and my offerings and really into expressive writing as well. So that's something I work with people on. It's another technique to kind of free your emotions. Mm -hmm. So good. 
you are always such a pleasure to speak with. I the pleasure adore. is mine. <laughs> I adore the work you do and um and inspired by it. Um, and I hope everyone who listens reaches out to you. Or if you would like to continue the conversation with me, you can take me up on my uh free coaching call. It's in the link, uh, Calendly link. Um, or you can email me, Pasha at Pashamarla.com. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Pasha Marlo. So hopefully you'll, you'll reach out if you like this episode or you think it would be useful, please share it with somebody who can um, potentially share it with somebody else who really needs to hear it. Right. So that would be uh, very helpful. So thank you so much, Tracy, for being here. Thanks, Pasha. I'll talk to you soon. I hope. You know it. Yay. Bye everybody. Bye. Hello, everybody.